Thank you, Greg. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's both a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening and to have this opportunity to talk about gold and specifically to talk about physical gold, which I call money of the 21st century. Um, Eric, if you could get the uh, presentation up there, I'd appreciate it. There are a couple of themes that I'm going to make this evening. Uh, the first and most important is that I want to explain why gold is not an investment. Now, this sounds contrary to what you may be seeing and hearing throughout the world today, but gold is money, and I want to explain why it is money and not an investment. I want to start out with this table, and if you look at it, you can see that this is gold from 2001 to 2010, annual percentage change against nine of the world's major currencies, US dollar, Australian, Canadian, Chinese yuan, Euro, Indian rupee, Japanese yen, Swiss franc, and British pound. If you look at the bottom, you can see double digit annual rates of return against all of those currencies over this 10 year period of time. And you'll say, well, of course gold is an investment. Look at these rates of return it is generating. Well, I'll get back to that in a minute. But I just want to make a point first on this chart before moving to the next one. There's a lot of discussion about gold being a volatile commodity. If you look at 2008, for example, gold was down 14% against the Japanese yen in that one year and up 43% against the British pound in that same year. And you would look at that one year in isolation, and you'd say, yes, of course gold is very volatile. Look how it's down against one currency, up against the other. But look at the sweep over the 10-year period of time. You know, 14.9% against the, um, I didn't do that. <laughs> there we go. 14.9% against the Japanese yen and 18.3% against the British pound. When looked over the 10-year period of time, the returns or the appreciation of gold is very, very similar. So the volatility doesn't come from gold. The volatility comes from central banks and the differing policies that central banks may pursue in any one year versus another central bank. So in 2008, gold um, fell against the Japanese yen but r rose against the British pound. But over the sweep of 10 years, all central banks are doing the same thing. They're debasing their currency relative to gold. And that's what this chart is showing. Gold is not an investment, it's money. And I want to make that point with the following, um, following chart, but just a couple quotes first. Gold still represents the ultimate form of payment in the world. Alan Greenspan, testimony before Congress in 1999. You know, he's implying that gold is money. And it remains the standard by which all things are measured because gold is indeed money. Uh, let me use this chart to make this point. This is crude oil prices, base 100. In other words, I've assumed that the four currencies in which I'm going to show you crude oil prices started out as 100 in January of 1950, and then you sh show what actually happened from that 100 base to the present. And you can see this is the British pound, and what cost 100 in uh, 1950 at the peak in 2008 cost 7,800 and today costs approximately 7,600 of those units, 76 times more expensive than it was in January of 1950. Second currency I'm going to look at is the US dollar. Now, the first thing you will see that the price of crude oil is rising also in terms of US dollars. We know crude oil is getting more and more expensive all of the time. And as bad as the dollar has been in terms of maintaining its purchasing power over this period of time, it's better than the British pound, which has lost even more purchasing power because of inflation over this period. So in a way, the Federal Reserve is doing a better job of managing the dollar than the Bank of England is managing the, 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 uh, the British pound. Keep in mind, we're comparing these currencies against the same standard, a barrel of crude oil. Now, the third currency is the euro. Um, and from 2000 back to 1950, the Deutsche Mark and then the euro since then, it's by far the best currency, but notice what happened in 2000. You know, it, the Deutsche Mark held its value pretty well compared to the other currencies, but the euro is starting to look more and more like the British pound and the US dollar in terms of losing purchasing power. Now, here's the shocker. Take a look at the fourth currency, which is gold. This is the price of crude oil in terms of gold, but look very carefully at the bottom of the chart. The price of crude oil in terms of gold has not changed over this entire period of time. 
An ounce of gold still buys the same amount of crude oil that it did 50, 60 years ago. I like to say the same thing is true about silver. You know, I remember as a young kid growing up in the 1950s that my parents could drive to the local gas station, use two silver dollars and fill up the family car. Today, you can still do that when you use the silver content value, not the face value of the coins, but the silver content value of those two silver dollars is approximately $75, $76. You can still fill up the family car with two silver dollars. Gold and silver preserve purchasing power over long periods of time, and that's one of the critical functions of money. But look at this chart again, because this explains why gold is not an investment. In 1950, you could buy a certain number of crude oil, barrels of crude oil with an ounce of gold. 60 years later, you could buy the same number of uh, of barrels of crude oil with an ounce of gold. You haven't increased your wealth. Who wants an investment that doesn't increase your wealth over 60 years? But you do want money that preserves your purchasing power. And that's one of the key functions of money, and that's exactly what gold does. And gold does this for a very, very important reason. You know, we talk about the M's, M1, M2, M3, the quantity of money. Well, the quantity of money is the above ground stock of gold which grows by about one and three quarters percent per annum, which is approximately equal to world population growth and new wealth creation. So we have this consistency in gold's money supply relative to new wealth creation and population worldwide. And over long periods of time, as Justin explained in his book, um, The Golden Constant, and as I'm showing here with this, with this chart of crude oil prices over the last 60 years, gold preserves purchasing power, which is one of the most critical functions of money. Now, when you look at a portfolio, you basically have two different categories. You have your investments, which I've outlined there in blue, and you have your liquidity or your money, which I've outlined there in green. When you're talking about gold, gold bullion, physical coins, physical digital gold, whatever it happens to be, bars, you're, you're talking about liquidity, you're talking about money. So it goes into the, that part of your portfolio. It's not an investment. If you call gold an investment, you're starting down the wrong road because you're comparing gold to other things that create wealth and produce cash flow uh, based on the risks that you're taking when you make an investment, when you put your money at risk. Gold is money itself, so it, it can't be at risk for that reason. It can't be compared to other investments. That's why in that first table, I compared gold to what it should be compared against, which is all of the other money options in the world, which are national currencies. There's no fixed percentage as to whether you want to have a lot of assets or a lot of liquidity. You know, that, of course, depends where we are in the boom-bust cycle. But when you're in the boom-bust cycle, you tend to want to hold a lot of gold because financial assets become doubted. You want to own tangible assets because there is no counterparty risk. And that's one of the key attractions of holding gold as money. It's the only money that's not based on someone's promise. And in a financial bust, when promises are increasingly broken, you don't have to worry about that promise being broken when you own gold. I want to go back a little bit of uh, history here and some general terminology before carrying on to a couple of other important points explaining why gold is likely to become the money of the 21st century, just like it's been money for the previous uh, 500 centuries. I define money as a little, little bit differently than most people uh, do it. I like to distinguish between um, money on the one hand and currency on, on the other. Money is a mental tool that enables economic calculation. It enables us to calculate the price of goods and services just like I did on that chart of crude oil prices. So money does the same thing today it did you know, 5,000 years ago. What's different is currency. It's a medium of exchange. And it improves as a result of technological innovations. You know, we've had various forms of currency emerging and evolving over the, over the eons. And that's a good thing, because if you can improve the efficiency of payments and the use of currency, it lowers the cost of commerce, because payments is an impediment to commerce. If you lower the cost of commerce, that's also a good thing, because it creates more opportunities for people to interact with one another in society to everyone's benefit through the creation of goods and services. The other thing about currency is that its essential nature has fundamentally changed. It changed from a tangible asset, in other words, a coin, um, which had no counterparty risk, to a financial asset, which is the liability of a bank. So, you know, over time, you had the evolution of currency moving from metal accepted by weight, 
you know, coins. Eventually, somebody developed the idea of milling edges um, of a coin so it couldn't be clipped or you could see if it was clipped. You know, all of these are improvements and refinements of, of, of currency. But in 1694, you had a fundamental change in the nature of currency. Instead of having this tangible asset circulating hand to hand, the Bank of England said, this gold, this silver is too valuable to move hand to hand. It wears out, it can get lost, it can be stolen. Leave it in the bank and we'll give you this piece of paper called a banknote and let the piece of paper circulate in the place of metal. What happened was, is a tangible asset um, of currency now became a financial asset, a liability of a bank, and that brought in a whole new level of risks. While it made commerce more efficient, it brought in whole new levels of payment risk because when you'd pay somebody with a bank note, the exchange was no longer extinguished. If I put a coin over the counter, a gold coin, and receive a good in return, the exchange is extinguished when an asset exchanges for an asset. But if I put a bank note over the counter to pay for a good, the shopkeeper does not extinguish the exchange until he makes good on that banknote, either by buying some tangible asset or redeeming it for gold. And that brings on a whole new level of risk um, that is generally called payment risk, which is now even greater because we've morphed into units of account, you know, bank units of account circulating by check, wire, plastic, and even now mobile phones as the evolution of currency. So back to, to put it, you know, in terms of an illustration, under the classical gold standard, you had liabilities of banks, you know, banknotes, uh, pieces of paper, backed by an asset. And what you've got now is you've got fiat currency. It's still, you know, bank units of account circulating, but it's backed by a question mark. The question mark is what are the assets of a balance sheet worth? If your bank owns nothing but Greek sovereign debt, what are the liabilities of that bank worth? They're not worth a lot. And given the fact that there's so much bad debt in the world because of the boom that had occurred in the 80s and the 90s, and that governments are unwilling to let the system cleanse itself and bank balance sheets be brought back down to prudent levels, there's a big question mark as to what national currencies are worth because we really don't know the quality of the asset side of the balance sheets of the banking system, not just in the United States, not just in Europe, but globally. So, when you're looking at currency, you have to benefit, you have to look at the pros and cons, the risks and the costs. And with tangible asset currency, you know, in this world, nothing is perfect. Uh, you know, the Romans knew how to debase coinage. They knew how to mix uh, copper in gold coins and debase it and try to fool people. Uh, and that created inflation in Roman times. And that's the risk that you have with tangible asset currency. But, but financial asset currency, um, the, the stuff that we've been using, you've got a lot of risks. You've got government debasement, inflation, when they can create currency without limit, which is presently the case. You've got payment risk. You know, money in the bank may not be good when you get to spend it because your bank goes belly up. You've got uh, bank failure. The money you have on deposit uh, isn't good. Uh, global imbalances. You know, sovereign wealth funds are a creation of the fiat currency system. The reason why we didn't have sovereign wealth funds in the 1920s or before during the classical gold standard is it wouldn't have been possible to have a sovereign wealth fund. They're only a function of the fact that central banks are managing currencies and they're allowing these excessive huge imbalances to occur by their policies that they're pursuing. And lastly, you have the costs of clearing and settlement which can be quite substantial with the present banking system. You know, when you have liability circulating as currency, Banks' balance sheets are out of balance constantly throughout the day until 3 o'clock in the afternoon when they go in the overnight market and bring their balance sheets back into balance. That has a huge cost associated with it. So as we look forward to the 21st century, there are a couple of themes that we're looking for. Clearly, we need a safe place to put our currency because we don't have that anymore given the way the present system is working. Not the banks because of the boom and bust cycle caused by fractional reserve banking. All you have to do is pick up the paper and read about you know, the troubles at Bank of America, the troubles at Citibank, the troubles at the banks in Europe. All banks have, have significant problems and they're not a safe place to put your money. We need an efficient, low-cost currency for global commerce with no clearing, settlement cost, payment risk, or political risk. And I highlight political risk. And let me use this chart to um, illustrate what I'm, uh, this quote and then a chart to illustrate my point. This is from Ben Bernanke uh, back in 2003 before he became chairman of the Federal Reserve. The U.S. government has a technology called a printing press, or today it's an electronic equivalent, that allows it to produce as many U.S. dollars as it wishes at no cost. Now, like most things that come from the mouths of central bankers, this is a half-truth. 
There's no free lunch in the world. Of course it has a cost. It may not have a cost to the U.S. government, but it has a cost to everybody who has dollars in their pocket or in their bank account. That cost is a cost of inflation. So you always have to read between the lines what central bankers are saying. But more importantly, this is an indication of the, of the attitude that we have in Washington today, that they can just spend and spend and spend and put it on the backs in, of each and every one of us. Now, I want to use a chart to illustrate why I think we're on the road to hyperinflation. This is based on my analysis of monetary history. When you give government the ability to spend, spend, spend without any control, you ultimately lead to a destruction of the currency through hyperinflation. And I want to use this chart to illustrate my point. This is federal tax receipts uh, from January 2000 to the present, June 2011. And what I've done is I've taken a 12-month moving average because, you know, there's a lot of volatility to when money comes into the government when they collect taxes. And by using a 12-month moving average, it sort of smooths it out. And you can see that after 9-11, there was a recession. Then we had the big housing boom. And this is the collapse of 2008. And now tax revenues are, are going up. But let me compare this against what the government is spending. And you can see here this huge gap. What we are facing is not a cyclical problem. We're facing a structural problem that policymakers do not yet understand, or if they do, they're not coming to grips with it. You've got a huge imbalance between what the government is receiving in revenue and what they're spending. And more importantly, 40% of what the U.S. government spends now comes from debt, from what they borrow rather than revenue, and historically, when you hit that 40% level, that's a sign you're very, very close to hyperinflation. And even more worryingly, if you look at QE2 from August to June, when the uh, quantitative easing, when the Federal Reserve was buying U.S. government debt, during that period of time, the U.S. government debt rose by about $900 billion. $500 billion of that was purchased by the Federal Reserve. The U.S. government is spending so much money, forcing it to borrow, it's borrowing more money than the market is willing to lend to it, which means one of two things. The U.S. government can't spend that money, which is not going to stop spending. So it has to turn to the Federal Reserve and turn that debt into currency. That is the path to hyperinflation, a central bank turning a government's debt into currency, whether it's Weimar, Germany, Argentina, uh, Serbia, the continental during the, this country's first currency, or the US dollar. We're on the path to hyperinflation. And I think we're getting very, very close given where the numbers presently are and given the structural deficit and given the huge growth in debt. Look at the trend in growth of debt. This is quarterly and where we are today. We're right up at the debt limit at 14.3. And when that debt is increased on August 2nd, which it inevitably will be, they're talking about spending $2 trillion of debt from August to November 2012 you know, what is that, 15 months, $2 trillion of debt? Because they want to have the next administration solve the debt problem. My point is, and I think the way the market is going to perceive this, is that this is the tipping point. If the debt limit is increased, and I expect it to be, people are going to say to themselves, or the market will say to themselves, well, they don't have the political will now. They don't even have the political will to cut spending in the future, let alone what they should be doing with cutting spending here and now and today so that the money is brought back onto a sounder basis. So if they don't have the political will now, why will they have it in 2012? And I think we're pretty close here at the end of the road in terms of a collapse of the dollar and its hyperinflation. Let me wrap up with just a few couple of comments. You hear a lot of talk today about the gold standard but there's a more, efficient, uh, there's a more important uh, issue that needs to be addressed. Do we want money delivered by government or do we want money delivered by the private sector? Do you want a parcel delivered by UPS or do you want a parcel delivered by the post office? You know, I'm in favor of competition of currencies. I'm in favor of letting the market do what the market does, which deliver the best available product for the least cost and let the market pick and choose. What we need to do in this country, we need to move away from the system that we presently have and create a system of competitive currencies and allow the free market to come back in and create currencies and compete with one another in order to deliver the most efficient currency to the marketplace. 
The reasons for the efficient currency is you reduce the cost of commerce. As I made the point before, the lowest cost currency is the best because it creates more opportunities for people to interact with one another in society, which is a good thing because the more commerce we have, the more goods and services are going to be created and the more opportunities we have to raise our standards of living, which is what it's all about. Global commerce needs a common currency not subject to political force. You know, today, currencies around the world are be, being used as a weapon against enemies and, be using, and also being used uh, as a treat, you know, so that a vested interest can be favored by the policymakers in whatever government you have to be talking about around the world. That's very unfortunate because what currency should be is a neutral tool in commerce. It should not be one that it is used to advantage of certain groups over the disadvantage of others. Because what's happening in this country is the middle class is getting killed. It's getting killed by the low savings rates. It's getting killed by taxes. Uh, and when you kill the middle class, you kill capital accumulation, and you're basically destroying our society. Sound currency creates a level playing field for everyone, and that's what gold and silver is all about. I'd like to end with this quote from um, Howard Buffett, who's the father of Wall Street legend Warren Buffett. He was a four-term congressman from Omaha um, back in the late 1940s, and he actually said this in 1948. Um, he was a successful businessman in Omaha before he did his public duty by doing four terms in Congress. In a free country, the money unit rests upon a fixed foundation of gold or gold and silver, independent of the ruling politicians. Independent of the ruling politicians. Now, I want to use a real life example to explain what Howard Buffett is talking about. Why was the Bundesbank independent? Why did the Allies in 1951? make the Bundesbank independent from the political system and ingrained in the psyche of the German people that the creation of money had to be independent from the political process. Well, you fight wars with central banks. Central banks create the money that enable you to fight a war. And having won two wars against Germany, the Allies, reasonably, didn't want to fight a third world war. So they ingrained in the law, ingrained in the psyche, ingrained in the management of the Bundesbank, that you are going to be independent. And look what's happened now in Europe. The ECB is not independent. After the Greek crisis last May, uh, despite his pledges not to buy sovereign debt, and despite the EU rules pr pr prohibiting from doing so, the politicians got together on a weekend. On Monday morning, Mr. Trichet said he's going to be buying, US, uh, buying sovereign debt. They now have something like 80 trillion, uh, 80 billion dollars of sovereign debt on the ECB balance sheet of questionable quality. The ECB is under the influence of politicians. The Federal Reserve is under the influence of politicians. The outlook for the monetary system is not good. We're going to be going through something, I think, that's going to be a major upheaval over the next few years. And my only hope is that we go back to what the framers of the Constitution laid out after the, continent, after the continental collapsed. Gold and silver shall be the money of this country, as it was from 1792 with the Coinage Act, one of the first acts of the new Congress, signed into law by George Washington, until 1971, when President Nixon, under an executive order, unilaterally outlawed the use of gold and silver um, uh, in terms of uh, currency. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.